want to um, introduce Bill McDonald to you. Uh, most of you know him. Uh, you should because we're talking about his book today and his ideas. And uh, I don't want to take long because I know Bill's got, uh, you know, we're, we're wrapping up quite soon. But uh, when I called you the Honorable Bill McDonald, uh, I don't think that's, you know, apologies to, to Bill Graham, but you know, Bill, you, you are, and to Tom too, but you are, uh, you know, the Honorable Bill McDonald. And, and Sean and Heather proved it when they told us that you had, you, you of your title and and the respect you have as an elder uh, or an honorary elder. So, uh, Bill, you're going to you're going to conclude today. So, I'm going to hand over to you. Bad boy. I'm going to say what I'm going to say, and then I'm going to at the very end ask you to repeat Bill question, and hopefully, I'll have something to say. First, thank you very much to everyone who made <coughs> my day, this morning possible and for participating in the first public discussion of my book. I have long said writing is the hardest thing and used the most. Over a long life, I have written about a lot of things for many different purposes. I started writing for a public audience in Financial Post column on tax reform. Later, one of the globe's greatest editors, Dick Doyle, gave me op-ed space to discuss some of the public issues stirred up by tax reform competition law and foreign investment restriction politics of the then Prime Minister Trudeau, which I was fighting at the time. There would have been no book, however, and today's also wonderful. David, also wonderful. Globe and Mail editor, David Walsley, had not asked me, not quite six years ago, to write regular essays on Canada and mutual accommodation as a way to encourage discussion about the nature of Canada and its future role in the world. As he said, no one has written from outside the globe, more words than, than I have, thanks to him. Real worlds, real societies, real families need firm identity and realistic understanding of limits. Not quite 80 years ago, my parents had a popular Canadian book on their bookshelf the unknown country, written about Canada's unknown geography. My book is about the same unknown country, but about a different set of unknowns. Bumping up against others is unavoidable. It's what you do when it happens that determines what the future holds for you and for that. That is the unknown that makes Canada different. One of the biggest differences between Canada and the United States lies in their respective sense of limits. Canada has been shaped by three huge sets of limits, which both its leaders and followers have increasingly learned to accept and cope with success successfully. They are French English, the United States, and the economy. Belatedly, Canada is finally now accepting and addressing the need for reconciliation between settlers and First Nations, something Samuel Champlain got right 400 years ago. Success in anything requires leaders and voters who each get what is required. On almost all of Canada's greatest challenges, leaders and voters have got what was needed. On the First Nations front, one of Canada's greatest leaders was Champlain. 
a political and military leader, as well as a settler and an explorer. He amazingly saw the centrality of indigenous settler equality. The rest of the French settler society at that time did not see that. That huge failure is only now starting to be seriously addressed by both indigenous and settler leaders and voters. Their focus is reconciliation, not blame. One reason, Sean, you thought I might be okay was that at our first luncheon, I said mutual accommodation was what Canada was primarily about and that its greatest unfinished mutual accommodation business was with First Nations. Canada's indigenous relations and the evolution of Toronto are in my eyes, the only places where the world appears better to me than when I wrote my original globe essay. The United States today is a growing nightmare of rising mutual distrust within itself and between it and other countries. We will know how the leaders and voters of America respond in November. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo recently said, and I couldn't agree more, that Trump was not the cause of divisiveness in the United States, but that America's divisiveness was the cause of Trump. Canada, Canadians have always understood how very different each of the United States and Canada are from the other. Seven years ago, three years before Trump, in November 2013, I held a dinner in Toronto for the Washington super lawyer, Tom Box, and said that the United States was in its greatest political turmoil since the Civil War. I saw the causes as the original sins of its creation. Slavery followed by segregation, followed by ongoing discrimination. Rights and freedoms without the limits needed for them to work well. The reluctance to use collective action to solve collective problems. And too much either or this, too little both and. The United States is a fearful country. President Franklin Roosevelt, when he took office in early 1933, in the midst of the Great Depression, told Americans they had nothing to fear but fear itself. That is not something Churchill would have told fellow British citizens during the Battle of Britain. President Roosevelt knew his fellow Americans, as Churchill knew his fellow British citizens. Fearfulness and conspiracy theories are hard to handle. Americans have often been both fearful and conspiracy broke. Never more so, ever more so than today. Canada has a drive toward mutual accommodation the United States has a drive toward division. The U.S. was formed and preserved civil war by force. Canada, more by persuasion. The U.S. has, for the most part, become overall stronger through its focus on freedom and science both today are under increasing threat. The two things they have going for them are under increasing threat from both leaders and followers. The United States 
urgently needs more mutual accommodation and compassion. The world has two very small beachheads for the fight to get more of each. Canada for mutual accommodation, Pope Francis for compassion. The horrors of 1914-45 led the Western world to a post-war consensus around a new vision, new ideas, and new projects. I can't remember which of you said, it seems to take war to get the needed new visions, ideas, and projects. That has been my nightmare for the last 15 years, that we would repeat 1914. 1949. Hopefully, the foresight to avoid another era, era of horror will bring the world to a new consensus for a post-2008 new vision, new ideas, and new projects. I do not disagree how difficult it will be because for that to happen, the United States and China would have to make huge and timely pivots to increasing mutual accommodation. There isn't a single sign of that but today. A bearable future depends on each finding a way to pivot before it's too late. As those of you who know me, Mutual accommodation has turned out to be a very, very big idea for me. And I have found increasingly for the, those I talk to. One way to look at, at it comes from the great English philosopher of everything, Alfred Knox Whitehead. In one place he said, narrowness is the basis of all achievement. And another, the universe is vast. Both must always be accommodated. Another mutual accommodation perspective comes from the great German-American psychotherapist, Eric Erickson, who said, to be adult is to assert oneself in ways that enhance the ability of others to assert themselves. This is a demanding and increasingly needed form of mutual accommodation. Shortly before my wife Molly Ann died at the end of last January, I showed her my book and read my dedication to Molly Ann, my wonder girl, who has made possible everything I have achieved. She was not usually keen about praise from me, but she responded with her quiet signature smile at so many of her friends. Loved. We had one fine, wonderful family event last Christmas, 31 days before she died. The family asked me to say a few words. I started by referring to Irving Berlin's song, Count Your Blessings, from the film White Christmas. If my life is to be described in one word, it is blessed. I, Molly Ann, my parents, my children, their spouse, our grandchildren, Canada, my first 20 years in Montreal, the rest in Toronto, and the modesty of the Methodist life churches we have always gone to. These blessings pervade my book in ways that seek to spread blessings to a world in growing need of them. Molly Ann said the following words at our son Alex, marriage to Angela Lam, Canadian born daughter of mainland Chinese parents. In her remarks at the post wedding dinner, Molly Ann said, Bill and I are both wasps. We thought all our children would marry wasps. Only one has. Now our youngest child 
is marrying a woman from the great civilization of China. We think we are the better for it. She received a standing ovation. It came from our friends who saw Canada and the world in the same way as Moyan did. The minister who presided later told me she had never been at a wedding where the post-wedding remarks got a standing ovation. There's lots to disagree with in my book. Tom Bolker spotted a couple. Okay. The one he didn't spot was when I, in the same part, was when I said the NDP had run out of runway. <laughs> he, he didn't comment on that, but he commented on the, the two big mistakes he thought are mis, mis, misjudgments. I hope that the book will get kind of Ovation, Moyan's comments got from thinking people because they feel it captures a shared vision of Canada with its imperfections, some still very big. It's asymmetries. This is not a very symmetrical nation. I think the world needs more asymmetry. That's my view. And our empty space. Canada, to me, is a different kind of great country for a different kind of world. My vision of it is to be a good place for every kind of good people to live in, earn a good income, build wealth and businesses in a world that increasingly makes this possible for everyone. Canada still falls short of Champlain's 400 year vision of First Nations and settler equality. So John A. Macdonald indispensably achieved Confederation and a coast to coast country. But he could not have got First Nations more wrong. Canada shares many global challenges right now that most urgently needs to get its own economy and its own indigenous relations right. Thanks to everyone for everything. Uh, okay, Bill Ellis. Thank you, Bill. And thank you all for participating in this, this event and um, we're just, we're just so grateful you did. And I um, will leave it there. We want Bill to have the last word. So just on, on behalf of everybody who's worked on this project, thank you so we're, much. We're not going to do Bill Ellis. I think, I think you've got okay. Yeah. That's he'll, a question. He'll, he'll kill me when he sees me. <laughs> no, he won't. <laughs> He's given us something to think about. Thank you all. And, and that's a question you can... You can carry on at last. I'll, uh, I'll have to buy him a drink. You shall. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Sean and Heather. Thank you, Bill Graham. And thank you, everybody, Daria and Stacy and John English. I'm sure he's here listening. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.